Welcome to the Community Church Podcast. My name's Alan Cleveland. I'm the lead pastor at Community Church, and it's so great to have you uh, join with us as we explore God's Word today. Well, as you can tell, we are kicking off uh, a new series that actually is going to start today and end on Easter. And uh, so this is going to be a long series. Um, we're going to be walking through the, um, the Gospel of Luke. And uh, so if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. Our ushers can get you a copy uh, of God's Word. And, uh, and the way that Luke reads is a lot like a documentary. And it, as you um, kind of felt in that, uh, we had to find somebody with a good voice to be able to do that. And so uh, JJ downtown did a great job with that. And, uh, um, but as you can tell, there, there's... Um, some things that Luke tries to do in this gospel that's so different than Matthew, Mark, and John. And, uh, and, and so there's some differences between all three of these books. Um, and so what, some of the things that I want to point out this morning as we jump into this documentary uh, that Luke gives us of Jesus' life is this. Um, Luke, uh, let, me, let me read the first four verses and then we'll unpack it a little bit, okay? Luke chapter 1, it starts off in verse 1, it says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. And, and so Luke, the physician, Luke, the, the researcher, starts off and he says, I'm trying to compile a narrative. I'm trying to compile all the details, okay, of this story of Jesus. And, and so he kind of walks through some of these words. He's like, I want you to have a reliable account. I want, I want to research the eyewitnesses. I've talked to people who have seen these things. He goes on to talk about um, from the beginning, right? So, so he's saying from the beginning of Jesus' life, from the beginning of Jesus' account. I started from the beginning. Here's, here's something that's really interesting. Uh, the other three Gospels, they don't have the birth of Jesus. They don't talk about the birth of Jesus. The first two chapters of Luke are only found in Luke. Isn't that interesting? And, and so Luke says, I'm going to start from the beginning. I want you to know from the beginning all the details of Jesus' life and his story. And so he says, from the beginning. He said, I followed all things closely. He traced carefully. You ever have kids trace? You remember the carbon, the carbon paper? You remember that? Do they still have that? I don't even know if they still have that, right? But you put that down and you trace on it. You ever see a, like a four-year-old trace, right? Probably not the most accurate, Right? And so Luke is saying, listen, I've traced this accurately. I've followed uh, Jesus' life, every minute detail. And who does he write to? Who does it say he writes to? Theophilus. He writes to Theophilus, right? And, and so it was a very common name in the first century, Theophilus, right? So we don't know exactly who he was talking about, but we, but we know that Luke had a friend, a real friend named Theophilus. Do you know what Theophilus means? means friend of God. Theophilus means friend of God. So in a sense, right, we can look at this and say, you know what, God, Luke is writing this not just to a real person named Theophilus, but he's writing it to people who are friends of God. He's writing it so that we can know, so that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus' account, the account of his life is historically accurate, that we have an accurate historical foundation um, that we can look at as followers of Jesus. And so this book uh, that we're going to be studying for the, for the next several months um, has some real distinctive things about it, okay? And I already mentioned one that the first two chapters, um, but it's the longest book in the New Testament. Luke is the longest book in the New Testament. And if you compile it, what other book did Luke write? Come on, people. What is it? Acts. So with Luke and Acts, right? So Acts is kind of like the, the, the sequel to, to the book of Luke. And so it finishes, Luke finishes with the ascension, right? So starts with the birth of Jesus, finishes with the ascension, and then the book of Acts starts off with the Acts of the Apostles and the story of the, the early church. And with Luke and Acts, it actually takes up the majority of the New Testament. And so Luke actually wrote most of the New Testament. Um, 
There's about 30-some parables in the book of Luke. 19 of those 30-some parables are actually original to the book of Luke. They're not found in any of the other Gospels. Um, he uses the word sinners 16 times. 16 times. That's more than Matthew, Mark, and John combined. And so he's, he's got some things to say about sinners, right? He also um, is the only gospel to call Jesus Savior, right? So if he's going to talk about sinners that much, isn't it good to know that Luke's going to mention that there's a Savior for our sin? And so he does that many, many times. He alone uses the word salvation, and Luke is the only gospel writer to use the words redemption and redeem. So this is very distinct to Luke's gospel. And like I said earlier, the first two chapters of the book of Luke are only found in Luke. And that's what we're going to look at for the next month. That's going to be our Advent series as we look at uh, the book of Luke. And so uh, Luke chapter 1, um, I want to look at a uh, couple of different things in this passage. And I think it's interesting, the encounter that, that uh, the angel Gabriel has uh, with Zechariah and then with Mary. And, and it's interesting uh, it's interesting what Gabriel brings, the news that he brings to Zechariah and to Mary. Uh, do you, you guys familiar with uh, gender reveals? You guys see the gender reveal videos? Have you seen these? Has anybody done the gender reveal thing? There's no shame. You don't have to like, oh, I guess. Uh, right? So, so like when, when you're expecting, okay, um, and you find out what the baby is, right, if it's a boy or a girl, then these people do these gender reveals. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Where am I? Okay, and uh, and so they do these gender reveals, right? And so whether it's a cake, they you know they cut the cake, and inside it's pink or it's blue, or you know they pull the little thing on the box and it opens up, and the confetti's pink or blue. Okay, you guys are following me. All right, and uh, have you ever seen these things go wrong? Have you watched? Have you watched the video? You could Google this, right? Go to YouTube and be like, uh, "Gender reveals gone wrong." It is ridiculous. There was one. This couple, they've got this box up above them, and they've got the string, and, uh, and they, they both pull on it. Three, two, one, and they pull on it. The whole box comes down, smashes her on the nose. She's bleeding from her nose, right? So think about this. This is like a joyful moment for this couple. They're like, we want to share with our family and our friends, and then she's bleeding, right? And uh, there's another one um, where uh, the couple, they've got a ball. So you've seen it with the powder in it and they throw the ball, and then they hit it with a bat or whatever, and she throws it, and he hits it, and it doesn't break, and it shoots right back and hits her in the mouth, and it's like, it doesn't even break. I was like, oh my word, this is ridiculous. So here's the deal. 400 years of silence. The end of the Old Testament, Malachi ends, and, and it ends with this looking forward to What's going to happen? And so they're waiting and waiting and waiting. For 400 years, God is silent. For 400 years, God doesn't say a word. And then God speaks through the angel Gabriel, and he brings a gender reveal. And this is where we pick up. In Luke chapter 1, verse 5, look what it says. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the, di uh, of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Think about that. That here's this couple, right, who, who hasn't, they haven't heard from God in 400 years. And they're still faithfully serving God. It said that they walked blamelessly before the Lord goes on to say this, verse 7, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot, they casted lots, to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Right? So he's in, he's in, the, holy, uh, he's in the holy place and he's burning incense, right? This is his once in a lifetime experience. And he's burning incense and this angel appears. And listen to this. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. No kidding, right? 
And he was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. What, was, what do you think Zechariah's prayer was? What do you think his prayer was? To have a child, right? So, so for years, his wife is barren, right? They're getting older, they're getting older. Zechariah, once in a lifetime opportunity, he comes into the holy place. He's burning incense, right? There's this picture of our prayers going up to God. And, and Zechariah prays and asks God in his old age. He says, God, would you just give me a child? Would you just give me a son? And this angel appears. The angel Gabriel appears, says, do not be afraid for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And so we've got these parents, right? John's parents. And what do we know about John's parents? What do we know about his parents? What what does the scripture say? I just read it to you. What does it say? They're old. They're old. Yeah. They're advanced in years. Easy people. They're old, right? They're old. What else does it say about them? They're faithful. They are righteous. They are blameless. They are faithful people. They are servants of God. What else does it say about them? One more. Come on. What does it say about Elizabeth? She's barren. She's barren. I don't know if you understand the gravity of what that meant for a woman in the first century. I, I know what it means for women today. For a woman that, that wants desperately to have a child and can't. I've, I've sat down across from people and I've heard their hurt and their pain, but you cannot understand the depth of brokenness and hurt and pain that a first century wife experienced when she couldn't have a child. It was her identity. And so they're faithful, they're broken, and they're old. And they're praying for God to give them a son. And God gives them a son. And look what it says. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. Verse 14. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. So here's the thing. John's purpose. What was John's purpose? What was John's purpose? What do you know? What do you know? What was it? To what? What? To announce Jesus, to prepare the way of of the Lord, to prepare the way of the Messiah. It's interesting, even in this passage, it says that he was to prepare the people, that he was to prepare the people for Jesus. Um, When I was in high school, I I played halfback, and uh, um, my, my success as a halfback in high school was only because I had a what? I had a fullback. More than, more than the fact that I had an offensive line, I had a fullback that was five foot seven, 220 pounds. All I had to do was follow him. <laughs> I had a lead blocker. Listen to me, that's what John was. John was a lead blocker. He was preparing the way for Jesus. That was his purpose. And so it goes on to say this, and you will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. He was preparing people's hearts so that when Jesus came on the scene, and we read this in in the Gospel of John, that John is baptizing people in the river. He's baptizing people in the river and these disciples are following him and and John looks up and he sees Jesus walking along the river and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and his disciples left him and started following Jesus because he had prepared their hearts. He had prepared them to follow another. That was John's purpose. 
Zechariah said to the angel. We're going to unpack this a little bit um, a little bit later. But look at this. Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent. You will be silent. God hits him in the mouth. You will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not, what does it say? You did not what? You did not believe my words. You did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them, and he remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And so here's this story, right? This, this gender reveal. Gabriel comes and, he, and he's, he reveals the gender of the child that they're going to have, that they've been praying for, that they've been asking God for. And Gabriel says, your prayers have been answered. Here's your son. And Zechariah says, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And then we have the second gender reveal. This one went much better, Right? Birth of Jesus is foretold. Verse 26, look what it says. In the sixth month, the angel, of Ga- the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Same words that the angel used with Zechariah. Do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Same words that the angel used speaking to the shepherds in the field. Do not be afraid. Fear is the enemy of faith. Fear is the enemy of belief. And so the angel looks at Mary and says, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Second gender reveal. Jesus' parents. What do we know about Jesus' parents? Mary and Joseph. What do we know about them? Help me out. They're engaged, right? They're not married yet, so they're betrothed, they're engaged. The only way out of this type of engagement in the first century was what? Does anybody know? Divorce. So they were were technically, so to be betrothed meant that they they were basically married, and the only way out of this engagement, the only way out of this betrothal was was divorce, okay? What else do we know about Mary and Joseph? Mary's a virgin, right? She's a virgin. What else do we know? They're young. They're young. They're really young. They're like teenagers. And, and here's this teenage couple who are engaged, they're betrothed, they're looking forward to being married and starting a family and building a home and going on vacations. And this angel comes and gives them this news of a child. She's a virgin. What does it say about Jesus' purpose? That Jesus, the the birth of this son had a purpose as well. And Luke 19.10 says that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That this child was going to come and be a ransom for everyone. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, what did Mary say? What did Mary say in that next verse? How will this be? How will this take place? How is this going to happen? You see the difference between her response and Zechariah's response? That, that she's literally asking, she's saying, 
how, how is this going to happen? How is this, how, like I'm a virgin, so how is this going to happen? How am, I, how am I possibly going to have a child? Zechariah was asking for proof. Mary was asking for the details. Zechariah was saying, um, you expect me to believe this? How, how will I know this? Prove it to me. And so Zechariah, in his unbelief, he questions. He doubts. He questions what the, what the angel is saying. He's, he questions that God can even do this. Mary was just wondering, how's it going to happen? Look at Mary's response. Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. This is the sixth month with her who, who was called barren. And then verse 37, and we've heard these words throughout Scripture. Because listen, this isn't the first time that, that a woman was barren. This isn't the first time that, that God came and he promised a child to someone who was old. We remember the story of Abraham and, and Sarah, right? We remember the story of Hannah and of Rachel. We hear these stories of these women who prayed and asked and begged God, and God answered. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. You hear her response? Her response, it tells us that she believed what the angel said. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Two birth announcements. Two gender reveals, one is met with faith and one is met with unbelief and doubt. Zechariah was asking for proof. Mary was just asking for the details. Why is this important? Why is it important that we look at these two birth announcements? Why is it important that, that Zechariah's response is different than Mary's? Why is this in Scripture? Why does Luke, the researcher, the scientist, the doctor, why does he record very carefully, why does he draw or trace this account? Why does he give us every minute detail? Why does he show us that Zechariah responded differently than Mary? Why does he show us that, that God, uh, God judges Zechariah and causes him to become silent until the baby's born? Why is this all important? Here's, what, here's why. I think, I think that God wants us to understand this and he wants us to see the differences here because we need to understand that unbelief is a sin. That unbelief is what locks the door to the future. It's what kept the people of Israel out of the promised land. Did you know that? It wasn't because they grumbled and complained. It wasn't because, um, it wasn't because they wanted to go back to Egypt. It was because they didn't believe. They didn't believe what God told them. Unbelief is what kept them out of the promised land. You know that Jesus couldn't even do miracles in his hometown. Did you ever read that story? Jesus goes to his hometown and he can't even do miracles because they don't believe. Because of the unbelief in his hometown. It's the sin of unbelief. In Hebrews chapter 3, listen to this. In Hebrews chapter 3, Verse 7, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Referring back to the people of Israel. Don't harden your heart. Don't have a heart of unbelief. It goes on to say this. <clears throat> Take care, brothers, lest there be any, uh, any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Evil, unbelieving heart. The sin in the garden was the sin of what? 
It's the sin of unbelief. That the serpent came and said, did God really say? And Eve started to doubt. There was unbelief. There's a story, um, I was reading this past week, there's a story in 2 Kings chapter 7 of Elisha. Um, and Elisha is, is praying uh, that, that God would rain down food, right? That God would give food uh, to the people. And, and this one response, you got to see this, uh, this one response, so he's talking about the food coming down out of heaven, uh, and he says, about this time tomorrow in the gate of Samaria is, is when the food's going to come. The captain answered the man of God. So this captain looks at Elisha and he, and he says this, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? He's like, is this even possible? If, if God could open up the gates and just rain down food, is that even possible? And listen to what he says. And Elisha said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. You will see it with your own eyes, but you will not taste it. Why? Because of unbelief. You want to hear what happens? This is where it gets like rated R, at least PG-13. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. He's like, listen, you don't believe it? You'll see it, but you're not going to taste it. Unbelief locks the door to the future. Unbelief keeps us from experiencing what God has in store for us. Unbelief creeps in, and we forget. We forget what God has done for us. Everything that doesn't come, this is Romans chapter 14, everything that doesn't come from faith, everything that doesn't come from belief is sin. And so God starts the story of Jesus off, these birth announcements, with a lesson on belief, with a lesson on trusting. Believing what God has said. You know what? I, I think that the, one of the only ways that we can keep ourselves from unbelief, that we can protect ourselves from doubt, is what? Does anybody know? Take a guess. What, what, could, what could Zechariah have done to keep him from not believing that they could have a child in their old age? Anybody want to take a guess? Boom. Boom. Remember, remember everything that God can do. Here's, listen, here's a couple who was blameless and faithful servants of God. Do you think that they heard the story of Abraham and Sarah? Do you think that they heard the story of Abraham and Sarah? Yeah. Do you think they ever heard of a, a woman by the name of Hannah who couldn't have a child and she prayed and begged God and said, God, if you just give me a child, I will give that child back to you. And God says, I will give you a child. She names him Samuel. He ends up growing up in the temple, serving God for his whole life. You don't, you don't think that they knew those stories? All he had to do was remember. All he had to do was look back and say, you know what, I remember what God did. The people of Israel, they're wandering around in the wilderness and they didn't go into the promised land. All they had to do was remember. All they had to do was remember the Red Sea. All they had to do was remember the plagues. All they had to do was remember what God had done for them. The key to protecting yourself from unbelief and doubt is remembering what God has done. Remembering God's faithfulness. This Advent um, season that we're starting today, my prayer for you is this, that you would remember, that you would remember God's faithfulness. Hey, thank you for watching. We trust that you were blessed by what you saw and experienced with God's Word today. If you have a concern, a prayer request, or if you would like to participate financially in the ministry of Community Church, you can find that information on the church website. 
God bless you. Have a great week and shalom.